Amen. Please join in spirit and in mind for the prayer for illumination. God of wisdom, speak again your liberating word to us today. By the power of your Holy Spirit poured into our hearts, make us ready and willing to respond to your call to us today. Amen. Please join for the scripture lesson in unison, Genesis 18, 1 to 15. Let us begin. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on. Since you have come to your servant, So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. So normally I would say, moving right along, but today we are, um, we're going to bless these, these little animals, um, and I know, and I told people to keep them in their pew uh, with you so that the kids could collect them, um, and, but of course, they, they're not here. These are so cute. So any young at heart people who would like, who brought some stuffed animals with you, would you uh, be willing to look around you and see if there are stuffed animals to be collected and we can bring them forward. Friends of Grace, which again is our our mission-minded folks who are keeping us um, active in the community. Uh, I think it was Kim was traveling and had the, and found the idea of for local ambulance squads, when they uh, a child needs to be brought in an ambulance, of course it's you know it's terrifying. So to have something, I'm going to pick this one up again, um, that, bring, that that can hold on to that brings comfort. comfort. Now like, these are the perfect. Some of the stuff that has been donated are going to be donated to our nursery just because they're too big. They act because it it's just storage. I mean, I mean this one is fabulous, uh, but. But it's not, they have to store it in the, in the ambulance, so it takes up too much space. So they asked for small ones. And how many, different, how many different squads said thumbs up to this? They love the idea. Five different ones. So isn't that wonderful? And I was, I was thinking, I mean, the different love languages that, that we have, one of them is touch and to be able to physically uh, to hold on to something and find comfort from it. And I was think like if we had done this last week, the, the table, the communion, something that we can touch, taste, smell, and see, right, is one of, the, one of the ways that God communicates God's love to us through something physical. Same with baptism, and, this, and, and same with this in these, in these little stuffed animals. That, and just, we're going to say a prayer for all the, the, the adults who tend to the little kids who are going to be comforted through such a small act of kindness. So, uh, so thank you for your generosity with these, with these little, these little ones. I picked up the cutest one. There's one in the bottom that, 
that I saw before. So, and I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, but somebody will be like, no, that's mine, that's mine. But these, I mean, these are just, these are just adorable. But let's, let's say a prayer. Gracious God, we are grateful that all the creative ways that we can show your love to others. Uh, and they're not going to know who did it, and they're not going to say thank you, uh, the, the, the kids or the families, but the, but the ambulance squads will. But that's not the important part. It's the love that we get to share because you have loved us, we get to share it, and our cups are overflowing, and this gives us such joy, and God, such a win-win, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the idea, thank you for all the folks who have, uh, who have showed up, and this is gonna be ongoing, so folks can continue to bring uh, stuffed animals. It is gonna be ongoing, I'll check that after I finish the prayer, but uh, Lord, just bless this and bless the folks who, for, with healing and peace of body, mind, and spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I need the lectionary reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 35, and then continuing to chapter 10 through verse 23. This is called part of what is called the missionary discourse. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Cananean and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it, but if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, Shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves, so be wise as servants, serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles." When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So last week, I was uh, preaching about putting our faith into action, and later that afternoon, I saw these photos on Facebook. 
This is Friends of Grace putting on a luncheon for 22 folks, serenaded as they, as they ate. And look at that. That picture just gives me such incredible joy. That is the joy of offering hospitality. I just think, you know, 22 food insecure people serve delicious food with, by smiling faces with gorgeous music playing in the background. What a way to honor people's dignity. Despite the hardships of their lives, they were gifted with good food, good company, and good music. Amen, amen, and amen. What jumped out at me from today's lectionary passages was the theme of hospitality, and I thought, oh, that's why they put these two passages together. There could be different reasons, but that's what jumped out at me. In, Gen in the Genesis passage, we have Abraham and Sarah who greeted these three strangers and offered incredible hospitality. And in the New Testament, we have the disciples uh, becoming apostles, and that means uh, being sent out on a mission in the name of another person. So the Disciples are becoming missionaries or apostles in the name of Jesus, and they're looking for hospitality in the towns where they go. So a few notes about these passages before we jump further into hospitality. The story from Genesis that we read about Abraham and Sarah always reminds me of my mother. My mom was a home ec teacher, and if there are younger people here, I would say, look it up. Uh, I don't think home ec exists anymore. It's in school they teach cooking and sewing and how to set the table and nutrition and, you know, and things like that. And she always read this passage and she goes, there's no way to make bread quickly. When it says, you know, quickly, you know, take some of your choice flour and knead it and make it. And she's like, and that to her was always like, I don't know. It's also an interesting passage because it talks about the Lord appearing to Abraham, but then they're spoken as, as three men or three strangers, and it, it kind of goes back and forth. We're not quite sure when Abraham realizes that, that, that he's talking with God, or, yeah, it's confusing, but we do know that their hospitality was absolutely stellar from the get-go. Commentators on these passages also note how God will use the, you know, the unlikeliest of people uh, to accomplish God's work, God's will. There's old Abe and Sarah, you know, who's, who are going to have kids, you know, and Sarah laughs, but notice she's not punished. And because it's like reading a text or an email, you can't tell the tone of something it, you know, that, you know, oh, yeah, you did laugh. It could have been, oh, yeah, you did laugh, which feels like a slap on the hand, or it could have been, oh, come on, you did laugh. You know, so, it could, you know, so we don't know. But notice she wasn't punished. She had her son. In the gospel passage, the 12 disciples are named, again, a ragtag bunch, fishermen, a former revolutionary, a seditionist, which is what we read when we read zealot, a former tax collector, and they are given authority to do all the things that the teacher does in this passage, except teach. They can cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Can you imagine? Yeah. That's it. No big deal. Go out. Do that. Uh, I believe in miracles, and I have experience with healing ministries. I think all of that is possible today that we have been given authority, but that's a road we're not going to take this morning. We're just going to glance down that path and, and proceed forward. The disciples are told to take nothing with them, that they have to rely on the hospitality of those that they meet. So whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy and stay there until you leave. The stay there part is, you, you know, somebody might find a really nice house to stay in. You know, like, oh, Philip's house has a pool. You know, let's all go to Philip's house. And they're like, no, whatever house that you start with, stay there. Uh, and the question is, that jumps out of this passage, what does it mean to be worthy? Find folks who are worthy and stay with them. The word in Greek is axios. And again, the root of that word means to have weight. We talked about this a while ago. To have weight. Like when you're making choices, you know, some people's voice has more weight than others. So the having weight to be worthy is in, in, this, in, this, in the root of it. So axios is likened to merit, being of worth or worthy. Uh, it's the same word that's used for the disciples for whether they are worthy or deserving of being fed. The worthiness here in terms of houses or towns they enter seem to correlate with hospitality. Who is welcoming? 
Uh, and by the way, the, Jesus limits the scope here of, of the towns that they enter. He says, don't worry about the Gentiles. We're going to just concentrate on the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But we know by the end of Matthew, it has expanded to the Great Commission, go out into all the world and, make, and baptizing people, uh, making disciples of all nations. And here we are because of their efforts. So Jesus tells them to wipe the dust off their feet if they're not welcomed, and then references Sodom and Gomorrah. This, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament, where the towns were destroyed, were the, the cries from that town that God heard were because of their lack of charity and hospitality. In Ezekiel, Sodom and Gomorrah are characterized as being prideful, having an excess of food, and not aiding the poor and needy. And when the strangers come into the city, we read in Genesis that they were absolutely inhospitable. They were angry and violent. So God's will is that we are hospitable or welcoming to the stranger. Again, in Matthew chapter 25, there's this parable where, you know, you know, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you? And Jesus says, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. So now we have to ask ourselves the question, how are we doing in the hospitality department? And you could say, look back at the pictures from the beginning, right? And we're doing great. That's wonderful. And yes, hallelujah, amen. But let's let the passage challenge us a little more. These passages don't speak to hospitality in our worship spaces, but in our towns and in our homes. How hospitable are we to strangers? And suddenly this passage gets a little more uncomfortable because we've all been taught to be leery of strangers. In fact, a lot of parents teach stranger danger. Um, I, I did not teach my kids that, although they heard it from other folks. I don't think it's good to... Uh, have our kids walking through the world in fear of other people. I don't think it's good mentally, emotionally, or physically for them. So I, I and if this were a small group, I'd be, I'd be asking, okay, or, you know, I'd be asking you all, what did you tell your kids? You know, uh, so that they, so that they, you were protecting them, but at the same time, not having them walk around in fear. I would say, I will never ask anybody, to, you know, I stay, you know, stay with me and, or I, you know, if, no, you're never to go with anybody without hearing it from my lips. So it's okay to be friendly, but don't ever go with anybody that you don't know or I haven't told you explicitly from my lips to say. But again, if this were a small group, we'd say, let's, let's talk about this together. How do, how do we do this? But it asks us, this passage asks us about hospitality. There's a funny, there's a very funny comedian. His name is Sebastian Maniscalco. He's an uh, Italian-American who's from my part of the world, so he talks like this, you know. And he said, he, he talks about the time when he was growing up that there was always a tin of cookies in the house that were for guests. Don't touch that. Don't, those are for guests. When the, the guests come, you can have that. And it, having guests over was, a, was an occasion, and there, you know, and you, you, you had food in the house just cause. He said, nowadays, if somebody knocks on your door, everybody drops to the ground. Don't move. Don't make a word. Maybe they'll go away. And how the world has changed. How hospitable are we to strangers knocking on our doors? Think about it for a second. Are we expecting anybody? What if they want to share their faith? Want me to make this even more challenging and uncomfortable? Strangers who knock on the door of our borders or our nation. What is the faithful thing to do? I'm not writing prescriptions. I'm just inviting us all in the struggle. Our faith is lived out in our world, and we've got to wrestle with this stuff. The sins of Sodom and Gomorrah were that they lacked charity and hospitality. In Ezekiel, they are characterized as being prideful, having an excess of food. They did not aid the poor and needy. 
in Matthew, when did we see a stranger, Lord, and welcome you? What is the right thing to do? The apostles were called to proclaim the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is here. What, is that, what does that look like? We pray for it every week. How do we live it out? Again, inviting everybody into the struggle. Not, I don't, I don't know the answers. In practical terms, what does it mean for how we interact in our homes, on our streets, and in our nation? What does it mean to be hospitable? So let me tell, uh, I've been debating about whether to share this story, but I, I'm going to go for it. I, I am so grateful. I am not a city girl. I live, I think, in Reburbia, which is a suburban area in, next to a rural area. You know, if you want to go see horses, you can, you know, come, come up by me. And, and I, I, for, for folks, no, I, I live up in Sparta, which is Sussex County, which is Reburbia. And... My daughter and I just took a trip to California. We, we, entered, we flew into San Francisco, and then we drove down to Los Angeles. And everybody had told us in San Francisco, there's a lot of homeless, and to be careful. And there were a lot of homeless. And every morning, even I went out to find a, a cup of coffee. Not just a cup of coffee, a latte. With oat milk, which costs that, right? And... On Yelp, you can find all these you know, fabulous places. So our hotel, in, when you're in San Francisco, is close to Chinatown. And then anyway, we, found, we, we found a good review when we went to this place for, for coffee. And as we're walking on the street, uh, this man approached me, and he asked me something. And I didn't quite understand it, but I thought he was asking for money. And I said, and I'm, I'm sorry. And that's when I'm like, Ugh, I should keep, like, change in my pocket, you know, or, or singles in my pocket because, you know, I'm not going to pull out my wallet. Right? And, and then Eve said to me, I think he asked you for a cup of Earl Grey tea. And Earl Grey makes, you, makes me think of Anybody? I'm looking at you, Christian. Captain Picard, thank you. Star Trek, and it's also my favorite. Any, star, any other Trekkies here? All right, so that's uh, uh, Captain Picard's favorite drink is Earl Grey tea, so, and it's mine too. So anyway, I'm like, Earl Grey tea, isn't that crazy? And anyway, so we're going in to buy our designer coffee, and he follows us in, and, and then I heard him more clearly. He's like, he's like, would you be willing to get me a cup of Earl Grey tea? And I said, yes, I would be, able to, I would be willing to buy you a cup of Earl Grey tea. So I get us the coffee, and, and we sh split a Danish, and, we go to, and we're waiting for it. And we had wanted to sit by the window, but the window seats were taken. And my friend is sitting over there, and we're sitting here. People move from the window seat, so we get up and move to the window. And then my daughter says to me, Ugh, I feel awful. And I just went, oh, darn. He's going to think that we got up and moved away from him. So then I sat there for a second, and so then I, and I got up, and I went over to him, and I said, my name is Robin, what's your name? And he told me his full name, Michael, right? and I said, would you, you know, would you like a croissant if I got you one? And, and he said, sure. So I got him the croissant, and then, this is me, right? My daughter and I were afraid that you thought that we moved away from you because, you know, but we really just wanted to sit by the window and Michael, I hope you enjoy this, have a great day. And then, then we moved down and, and I felt better about it. And at the same time, I'm thinking, oh gosh, I could never live in the city. I would have no money. And then at the same time, the irony is I dropped $20 every day for a good cup of coffee and a Danish, right? So that's the wrestle. That's the wrestle that we're all called into. How are we called to be hospitable with folks? And you know, what is the right thing to do? What is the wrong thing to do? I'm told, Evie told me afterwards that she heard him ask somebody else for a cup of coffee. You know, all right, he was having a full breakfast that morning. But I'm grateful that I li don't live in the city because I don't have people, right? And whether I wrestle with God, with, you know, with all of that. I also... I find it ironic during, at the beginning of, talking, just talking about hospitality, at the beginning of COVID, we all went, we're out walking our neighborhoods, right? And we started seeing neighbors that we'd never met. And I, we learned at the beginning, everybody who had a dog. And at the beginning, and I checked this out at my last church, we all asked each other, what is the name of your dog? 
We didn't ask each other, what, what, what is your name? And then I thought, how silly is that? And then I, so I started asking people their, their names. I'm Robin, you know, who are you? you know. And, and I, I've been thinking about it further. I bet you people don't ask it because they're afraid they won't remember it. And I know that all of you are, you know, I am very intentional about learning kids' names and people's names. And other things, I'm not, I'm not nearly as mindful, but I'm because it is so important for kids to know your names. And I think that is one of the ways that we offer hospitality to folks is by is by learning names. But it, and you have to also be willing. Can you say your, again? My name is Robin. What is your name again? And then just really try to to catalog it. But that again, that's hospitality, and that doesn't cost a dime. I on social media some other fabulous stories of hospitality. On a plane, there's a little girl flying by herself, and you know, so she takes a seat, and then people are coming in, and there's some, uh, you know, people are looking like, you know, who's who's going to sit next to the, and I, I think it was open seating, and finally, this young couple sat down next to this girl, and this is all, but from the perspective of somebody who's sitting against the aisle, across the aisle, and took a picture, this little girl was a chatty Kathy on the plane and she said but you know an hour in the guy they're doing sticker books together and the guy's got a sticker on his beard and she goes and they just rolled with it right the, the stewardess comes and asks them what they would like to drink and she goes I'll have a glass of water and they'll have water too we're going to do watercolors together <laughs> and she said and they just rolled with it and she goes there are good people in the world that's hospitality that's hospitality. That's what, another story, another uh, airplane story. This young mom, two babies, an infant, and then a two-year-old, and it's past nap time, apparently, because the child has just lost it. And this mother looks completely weary, and this woman writes, and then you saw all these women get up and pull whatever they could out of their bags and talk to the mom, would, be, would it be okay if we, you know, played with your son and she and she and the mom starts crying because she's just so grateful and they were able to entertain this little guy until he got on the plane and then fell asleep thank you Jesus yeah, but that's hospitality right out in the world uh, church doing you know we should always be mindful about how we greet people in our space as churches absolutely uh, I mean you always hear that and you probably have done this where you have gone to a to a church and not one person spoke with you, right? That, we, that's when we need to, that's when the Holy Spirit is screaming, hello. And, but to be mindful of that stuff, the ministry that you're doing for folks out in the community on your turf, wonderful. Where I'm challenging us this morning is how we are hospitable out in the world. And again, I am assuming that I'm preaching to the choir, but it's so, there's, we talk nowadays about missional church, which I think it's so churchy to create a word missional, but it means being outward focused. And there are five practices of missional churches. And there's, and when I was working for the Presbytery, I, part of my job was to get people to come to these seminars about the five practices. Everybody came to the one on hospitality because hospitality was about everybody's understanding of that was inviting people in. The stuff that was outward focused, people were a lot, you know, I, you know, I don't know about that. I don't, you know, so that's, that's where we need to do our work. And that's where I think the Holy Spirit is calling us to be, to wrestle with how are we hospitable wherever we are. Again, assuming that I'm preaching to the choir. So with some of this stuff, with our wrestles, with Lord, how do I be hosp hospitable in this situation? You know, there's some, oh, Lord, help us moments. And the good news is, he will. In Jesus' name, amen.